Samuel R. Delaney's Babel 17, published in 1966, is a unique and original space opera. As is to be expected with this author, Delaney delivers the weird, the wild, and the profound. Delaney is a fantastic writer with a very unique writing style. All of his work, the work that I've read, it's fit to be read. And along with Babel 17, I would highlight and recommend Dahlgren and Stars in My Pocket Like Grains of Sand, as well as the not specifically science fiction, silent interviews on language, race, sex, science fiction, and some comics, a collection of written interviews. As with each review on this channel, the episode will begin with a spoiler-free review, character analysis, and plot summary. Following that summary, I'll announce a 5 likes and a 5 dislikes segment that will include spoilers. If you haven't done so already, click the subscribe button and the notification bell before we start. Unique for 1960 science fiction, this book features a female protagonist. Ryder Wong is a linguist, a poet, and perhaps telepathic. Every bit of this novel is unexpected, including Wong. Rydra is called in by the Alliance's General Forrester to discuss the war between the Alliance and the invaders. We are clear right from the get-go this is a galactic setting. More specifically, Forrester has brought Wong in to discuss Babel 17. Babel 17 is a presumed code that the enemy invaders are using, and deciphering this code is presumed to be a game-changer in the conflict. The story quickly sets up Wong as a brilliant linguist, cryptologist, and a poet, famous throughout many galaxies. Her celebrity certainly is a currency in this universe. It's revealed early on that she has an ability that at least resembles telepathy as she interprets Forrester's inner thoughts that includes his immediate attraction to her. He thought I didn't understand. He thought nothing had been communicated. All the misunderstandings that tie the world up and keep people apart were quivering before me at once, waiting for me to entangle them. The invaders are perplexing the alliance with surprise attacks, espionage, and sabotage. The military, having picked up on chatter prior to each incident of sabotage, are certain that unlocking the code to Babel 17 can change the tide of the conflict. Ryder discovers quickly and informs the general that Babel 17 is far more than a code. It's an entire language. Here's our first and primary dive into the unusual. Babel 17, the language, and the book, presents us with Delaney's deliberate relativistic linguistic theory that humanity is shaped by language. The idea here is that if a language does not have a word for something, let's pretend for a moment that Klingons don't have a word for meander, then it means that that thing, that form of movement, doesn't exist for Klingons, or at best, the concept is confusing. Upon brief research, Delaney's writing does that, and it compels you to pause your reading to look things up. I understand that there's a name for this theory beyond just linguistic relativism. The theory, popular when this book was written, is known as the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, or Whorfism, no relation to Whorf from Star Trek despite my probably coincidental Klingon example. Though the idea is a foundation of the story, the narrative does not rely on the real-world accuracy of this theory. It's enough that the theory is a rule in the universe that Delaney created. Though the book does not feel at all like hard science fiction, the prevalence of the importance and examination of language somewhat fits that bill. Rydra is the main conduit highlighting the linguistic theory throughout both as a poet with an uncanny ability to take others' confusing thoughts, thoughts for which they may not have words for, and to articulate in a meaningful and pleasing way, and as the language expert who is translating bits of code and seeking fuller understanding and discovery of the Babel 17 language. Mastering this language cannot be overstated relevant to the strategic advantage that it could lend to Rydra and thus the Alliance. It maybe also has some Trojan horse side effects and is of course not treated lightly. The language is clearly considered a weapon. Less clearly, on purpose, the reader is asked to ponder if it could be considered otherwise. While up to this point the background that I'm sharing is a good starting off point and enjoyable and enlightening for the things Delaney gets the reader to think about, 
The real joy in this classic are the characters, the world building, and the adventures. Avoiding spoilers, I'll limit the world building and adventures descriptions to share simply that Rydra, also a starship captain, yes, this is a very cool, complex, dynamic, and all around badass protagonist, is given a starship for her quest and flexibility to recruit a crew and track down the invader's next point of attack. Her adventures take her to a number of exotic locations around the universe and includes space skirmishes. I'm not saying that you'll get the same vibes that I got, but mine included at times Neuromancer, The Star's My Destination, Shards of Earth, and Dune vibes. The people she meets are eccentric or unusual and not always who they seem to be. Descriptions of these places, or at least the atmosphere around them, are vivid. While there is no one like Rydra Wong in anything I've read, a number of other characters shine as well. Rydra's first targeted recruit is Brass. She needs to attend a non-typical wrestling match to assess Brass as a potential pilot. Apparently his proficiency in this grappling duel inside a globe against a giant silver dragon being, also a pilot, is relevant to the demands of piloting a starship. Apparently it's also proper form for spectators to enter the arena nude, or at least with minimal clothing, lest you be impolite. Most unique about Brass are his features. 10 foot tall, sporting a mane, I assume similar to a lion but sheared, saber teeth, paws, and a barbed tail. Much of the cosmetics here are surgical enhancements. Among the other characters filling out the crew, all necessary include the requisite three navigators, Navigator 1, 2, and 3. They are a threesome or a triple in their navigation roles, but also, as is necessitated by their tasks, somehow in their romantic, sexual, and psychological entanglements. One of the navigators is actually discorporate, dead or sort of dead, a virtual individual, and speaks Swahili, which the other two do not. Yes, linguistic considerations and communication are prevalent throughout all parts of this story. The crew also includes nose, eye, and ear. And no, I'm not going to explain that. They are also dead or discorporate, and they act as the ship's sensors. Then there are the children. The children are an integral part of the crew. They are managed by the slug. The final stage of Rydra's recruiting the crew relies on the approval of the surprisingly, seemingly bland customs agent, Daniel Appleby. Imagine Daniel's culture shock as he's introduced to these fantastical characters and he has to clear them for the mission. Fortunately, interestingly enough, he has psych profiles for all of them. Rounding out the list of non-crew characters that I want to mention, but will not elaborate on, are the Butcher, who suffers from memory loss and lacks the words for and understanding of I or you, the Baroness, the TW-55, and Baron Felix Verdorco. Some characters are deeper than others, but Delaney makes us care just enough about most of them that stakes are high enough and we are impacted by their successes or failures. I never like to overuse the term mind-blowing when doing reviews, and it's not accurate word choice to call Babel 17 mind-blowing, but it is fair to say that Delaney plays with your mind. The syntax and structure in this book are completely original, and the characters and story are fascinating. It's also worth highlighting how uniquely Delaney sets up a battle scene. Neurotics advance, maintain contact to avoid separation anxiety, let the criminally insane skiz out. Neurotics proceed with delusions of grandeur, stimulate severe depression, non-communicative with repressed hostility, commence the first psychotic episode. Now you surely haven't seen that in your science fiction before. My intention for the first half of this episode is to provide a foundation for the story, spoiler free, and a brief and superficial introduction to the characters to give just enough enticement for recommending this fit to be read adventure. The remainder of the episode, my five likes and five dislikes segment will contain some spoilers. Like number one, Rydra's ability to sort of read or finish the thoughts of others could be as easy as calling her a telepath. Delaney uses her ability to measure body language and precision of observation to present her as someone with an incredible power that is entirely plausible 
while still sort of feeling science fiction-y. Like number two, Delaney adds just enough effort in explaining to us that we are still in a sci-fi acceptable universe, explaining that the so-called raising of the dead can pass for at least pseudoscience in his created world. Dislike number one, I get the deal with Ryder explaining I and you to the butcher and the implications of it missing in the language it was still a reach. The moment loses credibility for me when she neglects to try first to explain it in the simplest terms. I also acknowledge that some of the deeper implication may have just been with me and the fault lies with me and maybe it was just over my head. Dislike number two. Some of the character work was left unsettled. There were some hints that Ron, Brass, and even the Baron were going to be highlighted more than they ended up being. There was definitely room for it, and the foundation for each was certainly interesting enough to pique curiosity to go deeper. Dinner tables got a lot of play, and they were interesting, but they had more layers to them than some of the characters that I wanted more from. Dislike number three, while I can accept it, it took me too long to figure out why Rydra had to recruit pilots and a crew if she had the support of the general. Couldn't he have whipped things up with short notice quicker than she could? It's lucky that he didn't, though, because, frankly, her recruitment tour was highly entertaining. We even get good descriptions here from Delaney as to why the pilot wrestling match was a relevant, stripped raw, literally and figuratively speaking, assessment of a pilot's value. Like number three, like William Gibson, Delaney has a way of introducing elements onto this world that we don't really understand. Where, for me, he exceeds Gibson in this regard is that the unknown and unusual is a bit more comfortable and relatable. It has to do, not surprisingly, with a mastery of language. I don't understand exactly why the mystical pickpocket discorporate madam is with the customs agent or what's the deal with her exactly and what his full purpose and responsibility are exactly, but I kind of do. I like being off balance without being lost. Another example is how interesting the feel of Ryder's ship is with very few references and descriptions and seeing wild things like the Animalian pilot, two boys, the slug, ear, nose, and eye, the undead navigator. Delaney again gives us only enough and just enough to get the ambiance and the wonder of this cool science fiction setting but he never gives us more understanding than is called for. This just may be the craziest ship crew ever. Dislike number four. That's right, you do have interstellar captain's papers. Thanks Delaney for letting the reader know that she's also a captain. Real subtle. This was odd, really odd, non-subtle dialogue here. So be it. Like number four, the banquet at the Baron's residence. I was captivated by the writing. Rydra hears or recognizes the Babel 17 and warns the Baron as they're being seated. The Baroness, clueless, keeps interjecting commentary about the meal. The pacing is great and there's a very clear sense for the reader of a calm before the storm. The visuals are also top notch here, from brass being seated in his custom hammock to the lamb and the pheasants popping up on the table, wine spilling and fruit rolling off of the side. Like number five, the writing style and atmosphere. Description of the environment, ambiance, atmosphere are unique and enjoyable. Not, oh my god, that's incredible, just unique. And Delaney has this way of writing where somebody speaks and then after they speak, you're introduced to who it was that just spoke. I really like that. He also has a tendency to intersperse dialogue in perfect cadence with characters in motion. You know how on the show uh, Law and Order, the cops are questioning somebody and that person almost can't be bothered to stop what they're doing and then they converse and the dude's like stacking boxes or making a salad or whatever and then the dialogue throughout is just going on and on and the cops are like, you mean you can't just sit down and talk? No, this person's too busy. There's a little bit of that going on. The dialogue throughout this is phenomenal. Bonus like, near the end of the book, we check in with Daniil again, the customs agent, and it's a fun scene. He's jubilant about Rydra and the wrestling matches that she had introduced him to at the beginning of the book. He's eager to show the same event to Doctor to Amarba, and it feels like we're revisiting and checking in with an old friend at the end of a thousand page epic, when in reality, it's a very short book. 
I will also note that I enjoyed the next scene where he gets cosmetic surgery to add a small dragon to his shoulder. It was sort of unnecessary, but it was a really fun addition. Dislike number five, I wanted more pages. It's a testament to the writer's skill that this short book felt like it contained 500 pages worth of action, ideas, and characters. Had it actually been 500 pages, I could easily see the extra 300 pages being used to elaborate more on the already interesting worlds, extend the action scenes, and dive deeper into the already captivating characters. For those who've read Babel 17, please comment below and let me know what struck you most about this book or how you felt about Delaney's focus on linguistics. Maki, when you learn another tongue, you learn the way another people see the world the universe. Thank you for watching. I'm Michael Leverts. This is Fit to be Read. Please like, please subscribe, please click the notification bell, and YouTube will let you know every Thursday at 1 o'clock when I release new videos. Thank you.